Welcome to today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light. Sun, Salt, and Light, S-O-N, knowing and growing in your daily relationship with Jesus Christ, but also being the salt and the light in your marriage, in your family, at your place of work, at your church, and even in the community you're in. I'm Pastor Michael Petit. This is a radio ministry of our church, Calvary Chapel Divine, here in Divine, Texas. We are so glad that you joined us for today's broadcast. We are a Calvary Chapel, so we simply teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We believe that God uses His Word to transform, restore, and to change lives one verse at a time. If you're visiting our area, you'd like to get information about our church or church service times, maybe even track down some of the other teachings that we have available through podcasts, whether it's through Audible or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can do all of that at our church website at calvarydivine.org. That's calvarydivine.org. So Genesis chapter 18, we left off with Sarah laughing as she was told that she was going to be the one having the baby. Uh, Jesus she hears it for herself audibly for the first time at this point she's she's heard it from abraham but she hears it from the lord and um she laughs now there are a couple things that we need to cover real quickly i want to make sure because i'm not sure if we covered these as much as we should have last week is one of the things that i i really loved about that portion of scripture is that abraham was serving alongside of sarah now He was not just at home. He was actually serving them at the table. Okay, so this is very important. I know we don't have a lot of men here tonight, but the ones that get this online, I'll make sure you get this. God did not call you to come home and just flop on the couch. Okay, it's very important that you understand God's called you to serve. He's going to give you more in this scripture here as he talks about teaching your children. And there's some important things that are there. The other thing that's there is Sarah laughs, right? Make sure you all get this. Sarah laughs inwardly. And the Lord knows. He's all knowing. But who does he ask? Why does she laugh? She asked Abraham. When Adam and Eve fell, when Eve fell, who did God go to? Adam. There's nothing special about men. Okay? Just FYI. We're we're nothing special. But God has put us in a place of authority. And unfortunately, this is one of the battles that is happening within the churches now. Is we're seeing um, churches that are, are installing female pastors. And putting in, put it into places of authority, and they're not supposed to be. And so God holds Abraham accountable. Why did she laugh? Abraham's like, I didn't know what's going on, but he's still held accountable for his wife's actions. So that's something for men for us to remember: is like you're you're to lead your home. God looks at you when it all goes bad. God looks at the man. God looks at the man. You, you, at the end of the day, y'all need to remember that. I love that because it, it's just one of those little pieces of Scripture that you can brush by and you don't pay attention to it because, look, Abraham laughed. Now Sarah laughs, but Sarah laughs inwardly. But Jesus goes, Abraham, why did your wife laugh? You know, what's going on? He didn't go, Sarah, why did you laugh? He held her account. He held him accountable, not Sarah. Just remember that. So when when things are going wrong at the house or things are going wrong in your marriage, God holds the men accountable. The men accountable. And I used to teach men, so that's why I, that stuck out to me. It's very important for you for us to get that. We make a lot of mistakes. And thank God for grace. But at the end of the day, God looks to us to lead our homes and lead our marriages, and we're supposed to. I I simply entitled this, Shall I Hide from Abraham What I Am to Do? Shall I Hide from Abraham from What I Am to Do? Verse 16 says this, Then the men rose up there and looked down 
towards Sodom. And Abraham was walking with them to send them off. So one of the things that happens is, is we continue to see Abraham's hospitality. We spoke about hospitality last week. But it would be no different than if you had a gate or a, a, a driveway and you walked them to their cars or you walked them out. He's just doing the right thing. He's being hospitable and walking along with them as they make their journey. And it's, it's just important. I love that because I get to do that with my grandkids all the time. It's hard getting them in the car, but it's so fun as I'm sitting at the gate and they're yelling out, Grandpa, and they've got something to say. And so it's just we need to be hospitable. Uh, and Abraham was that. But they, they looked down at the direction of Sodom. In Genesis 13, verses 10 through 11, Lot looked at Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot raised his eyes and saw all the vicinity of the Jordan that is well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt going towards Zor. So, let, uh, so Lot chose for himself all the vicinity of the Jordan and Lot journeyed eastward, so they separated from each other. So now Lot is in the city, and their eyes are looking towards Sodom. And so uh, we know that, that there has been, archaeologists have dug and found areas within and around the Dead Sea where uh, sulfur, when the destruction, and we're actually going to be getting into that when we get into Genesis 19, as we look at the destruction and, and we talk about God being just and dealing with sin. But it says in verse 17, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am to do? What am I about to do? Since Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So, the Lord already knows what he's going to do. But he's, he's using this as an opportunity to grow Abraham's faith. And, and one of the things that we love is everything that happens in, and in our world today, it centers on the timepiece of Israel. Everything. Everything. It is the center of the earth. That's where we're in times. That's where everything will, will take place and and so we see how important Israel is and, and, and that when Abraham uh, talks about being blessed, he'll be a, a mighty nation, a nation of, uh, of the earth will be blessed. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 6-9, through nine, it says, Just as Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. Therefore recognize that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham... The Scripture foreseeing the God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel before, beforehand to Abraham saying all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. So if you have chosen to follow Jesus, you are from the lineage of Abraham. You're part of the nation. So why do you think God cares so much about Israel? Why should you care so much about Israel as a Christian? Because you're part of it. You're part of the blessing. You're part of the blessing as, as, as we are in the age of the Gentiles. Right? Eventually what will happen is that that will come to an end. And then it will be the, the Jews that will come to faith. God will focus back on Israel. God is not done with Israel. Now what will happen is you see a lot of mess that's out there, you know, with the uh, Palestinian stuff, uh, the protests and the things that are out there as they use slogans like from the, the rivers to the sea or however they say that and they're, they're just saying, look, we want all Jews dead. And they're teaching the children that. And they're teaching our college kids that. And it, it, you know, as Christians, we support Israel. And what's sad is because of progressive Christianity, you have people that don't support Israel as Christians. And that goes against God's word. 
And we'll talk about that a little bit more. It says in verse 19, For I have chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord, doing righteousness and justice, so the Lord may bring, up, bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. For I have chosen him. And that word that's used there in the Hebrew is yada, to know intimately. It's, it's the same word that would be used in a, in a marriage relationship. It's, it's an intimate relationship. That's why we talk about our relationship as a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and it's important that we see that as, as we see a lot of things that happen within the church is you have either the fan or the follower. And Kyle Eidemann wrote a great book on that. And one of the things he talks about is he's, he explains uh, in the book of Fan and Follower, he talks about the enthusiastic admirer. And what that is is, is somebody who has no problem going to the game, supporting the team, who will even go as far as painting the, the, the numbers and the letters on his chest of the colors of the team, who has things hanging on the wall of the house and has his bumper sticker on the car for his favorite team. You can think about the Cowboys. You see a lot of people that do that. But he's never in the game. He just watches it from the stands. That's... That's, that's just a, a, a fan. They're just an enthusiastic admirer of Christ. You have to be in the game. Like you can be so excited to where you keep up with all your players and the stats and you, you, your, your whole world is based upon whether they win or lose. And, but you're just an enthusiastic admirer because you're not in the game. You don't suit up every Sunday and get in the game. That's one of the things he talked about, and he talks about how the American churches are, 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 you know, have become stadiums now, and it's filled with fans. They're there to see the latest worship leader, or they're there to see the, the greatest speaker, or the ones that are the top speakers of the day, and but they're not involved. They don't have a personal relationship with Christ. They don't have that yada. They don't have that intimacy with Jesus. See, Abraham had that with God. He had that with God. See, a fan actually is like Matthew 15, verse 8. These, uh, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far, far from me. See, a follower of Christ actually is intimately following God. It's a connection of... of of Yada, it's actually understanding that that you have been chosen, and that you uh, you have have repented and turned from your sin, and you have turned to Christ. And within that intimate relationship, God is doing a new work in you. See, with Abraham, Abraham was was you could see the change that was happening in Abraham. That little mess he had with Hag Hagar. Right? It's, it's, this is not the same Abraham that is standing in front of Jesus at this moment, the pre-incarnate Jesus. He's serving him. He comes and worships him as soon as he sees him. Falls to his knees. It's, it's, it is important for us to understand. And, and the thing that he says is, is, he goes, For I have chosen him so that he may command his what? His children and his household. After him to keep the way of the Lord. Doing righteousness and justice so that the, the, the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. I love that. He was commanded to teach his children. He's commanded to teach them the way of the Lord. And, and, it, and it, it says very bluntly, again, the man is the one who God's going to hold responsible. His children, 
His household. So when you get to heaven, you will answer for every thing as a husband and as a father for your family and how you led them. Did you teach them the way of the Lord? It's, this is why I love this piece of Scripture. We sometimes will miss this because we jump to the negotiation or the intercessory prayer that happens for Sodom. But that's such an important piece of Scripture that Jesus is saying. Like this, is, this is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ telling him this is going to happen. And for us, we are to lead our children. And, and unfortunately... That's the problem with America right now. We have fatherless homes. There's nobody leading the children. And it doesn't matter if it's Hispanic or black or white. It's affecting every ethnic group. Why? I'm married to the government. I don't have a place to stay. Section 8. 50 bucks a, a month. Kids get sick, Medicare. Don't have food to eat, food stamps. I mean, it, it, you, you need child support? We'll make sure he pays child support, but he can't be around the kids. It's like they, the government has done a, a, a number on marriages and families. But fathers, men, have a responsibility. They have a responsibility to lead their homes. We have to understand, like, when we look at this, the biggest struggle that we have with our children in today's society is we have only 2% have a biblical worldview. That's, that's ages under, under the age of 13. Only 2% have a biblical worldview. They're not being taught about God. So we're, what Abraham was commanded to do, we ain't doing it. We're not doing it. And, and one of the things I love is Miss Elba will always try to teach the kids when they're 15 months to 18 months old. Teach them how to pray. She'll go over books about God with them. And you're like, how can they even, at 15 to 18 months, they start grasping the concept you can start as early as 15 to 18 months to teach them about God. And the earlier that you establish this, the easier it will be for them as they grow up. Because once they hit the age of 13, it's a lot harder for them to discern what is biblically right. Because they don't have a worldview. That's why they support things like Palestine. It's, that's the reality of it. That's why they support things that go against God's Word. Because there's no biblical worldview. We have to teach them the Bible's inerrancy. We need to teach them about the character and the, the, um, the attributes of God. We need to show them the most important thing is you living a life of Christ around your children. That's the biggest problem. It's the hypocrites in the church. You tell your kids one thing, but you go do another. So when we look at this in that Barner survey, one of the things he said is that when there is no biblical worldview, that means that nine out of ten parents of preteens, they don't even have a biblical worldview. They have a kind of a grab bag thing. And so what happens is we're seeing in this new generation, most parents don't even have a biblical worldview when it comes to Marxism. Or whether or not it's okay to have new ageism, which is basically witchcraft. They start, oh, that's okay, you can do that. Oh, you can do yoga, Christian yoga. No, you can't. You're worshiping a God 
when you do yoga. But you have to have the understanding like God has entrusted you with those children to raise them and you will answer for it. I got five. Now, I'm not looking forward to that conversation. Because I didn't do a good job. I didn't start following Christ until I was 39. My kids lived a horrendous life because of mom and dad. We didn't follow Christ. So he tells Abraham, like, he's like, hey, you're going to teach your kids the way of the Lord. In Exodus 34, verse 14, it says, For you shall not worship any other God, because the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. So when we start allowing things to be placed in front of God, and this is why we can't support transgenderism or, 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 or I'm going to change my identity because, again, that's God's created you and you're saying what God created is not good enough. I need to change it. But see, that's a biblical worldview and that will set the world on fire right now. We're told in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9, it says, Hear, Israel, the Lord is your God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I commanded you today shall be on your heart. And you shall repeat them diligently to your sons. And speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get up. You shall also tie them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be as the front eyelets on your forehead, and you shall also write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, and the Lord on, on your gates. And so it's understanding like the Lord is, when we read this, he's like, these things should be taught and lived out every part of your house, every part of your life. Mom and dad, these are things you're supposed to do. Why? Because it teaches the children. It's teaching the children. And he says in verse 20, And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. The word outcry actually in the Hebrew means to describe uh, an impression or, or to be brutalized. And I would imagine there's an outcry here in America right now with Christians. There should be. We should be praying. There should be an outcry going to God. Should be. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 10 it says, And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You ain't hiding nothing from me. When, when Cain kills Abel, he thinks, well, what happens? The, crown, the, the ground starts to cry. God knows. Exodus chapter 22, verses 22 through 24. Let me get it back up here. It popped out in my bed. Exodus 22, verses 22 through 24. You shall not oppress any widow or orphan. If you oppress him at all, this is important. I love this. If, if he does cry out to me, I will assuredly hear his cry. Like you try to take advantage of a widow? Oh no. Lord's going to hear. And I want you to catch this last part. And my anger will be kindled and I will kill you with the sword. <laughs> and your wife shall become widows and your children fatherless. See, this is not the Lord we want to talk about. The just Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 15, it says, You shall give him wages on his day before the sun sets, for he is poor and sets his heart on it, so that he does not cry out against you to the Lord, and it becomes a sin in you. So what is the sin or the outcrying of Sodom and Gomorrah? I think it's important that when we look at this, is God judge Noah? You know, God judged the earth at that time. He judged Sodom and Gomorrah. 
In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4-9, through 9, it says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into, the, into hell, committed them to pits of darkness, held for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of, unga- uh, of the ungodly. So what was happening in the time of Noah is they were, there was an exploding population because of sexual perversion. You had demonic activity happening and, and the, the constant thought of man was evil. And so what did God do? He judged the world. See, this is the gospel nobody wants. But this is the gospel that's supposed to be preached right now. If judgment is coming, we just heard it from Matthew this, this past Sunday. Right? The great day of the Lord is coming. So do you think we should tell them the great day of the Lord is coming? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? Because that's what Jesus started his ministry with. Do you think the message that John the Baptist had? As he called out a leader, a government leader, for their sin. And we got pastors trying to, trying to silence other pastors. Shame on you. Shame on you. If, if it is sin, then you need to say it's sin. You don't, you don't dance around the issue. So you have, at the time of Noah, you have widespread corruption. You have constant evil. You have demonic activity. You have sexual perversion. And that was what was happening at the time of Noah. In Exodus chapter 33, verses 7 through 9, this is why I don't get why pastors are, are freaking out right now over th- stuff like that. It's, it's, it, it drives me crazy. Ezekiel 33, verses 7 through 9. It says, Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them a warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will certainly die and you do not speak to warn the wicked about his way. That wicked person shall die for his wrongdoing, but I will require his blood from your hand. But if you are part warned a wicked person to turn from his way and he does not turn from his way, he will die for his wrongdoing. But you have saved your life. Shame on us for not telling somebody they're, not, they're walking in sin. There should be, it should be given in love. But, but don't hide the truth from them. That's the problem right now. We have churches that are embracing the things that go against God's Word. And then when somebody speaks up, and I'm just a little somebody, I'm talking about like Jack Hibbs. When somebody speaks up, you have pastors trying to squelch them. Hey dude, you need to go back over there in the corner. Don't say another word. They're marching to hell. And you're not going to say something? You're not going to open your mouth the way that John the Baptist did, the way that Jesus did? It continues in 2 Peter. It says, If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having, them, having made an example of what is coming for the ungodly. If he rescued righteous Lot who was oppressed by the perverted conduct of unscrupulous people. For by what he saw and heard that righteous man were, while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day their lawless deeds. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from a trial and to keep the unrighteous under the punishment for the day of judgment. And Ezekiel 16 verses 49 through 50 gives us a little more insight to this it says behold this was the guilt of your sister Sodom she and her daughters had arrogance plenty of food carefree ease but she did not help the poor and the needy so they were haughty 
and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw them. So there's a little bit more going on than just homosexuality. They had excess. They weren't taking care of the poor and the needy. They didn't care. They didn't care. But then there was the sexual morality that was running rampant. They were neglecting and oppressing the poor. In Genesis 18, verses 20 and 21, it says, And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see whether they have done entirely as the outcry which has come to me indicates. If, I, if not, I will know. God already knows what's going to happen. He's sharing this with Abraham. And Abraham's fixing to go through a, uh, uh, an actual conversation with God. And it's going to show Abraham's maturity because he knows him. That Yada, he has that relationship with him. He can actually speak to him. In Psalm 25, verse 14, it says, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them known his covenant. In Amos chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Certainly the Lord, go, the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret plan to his servants and the prophets. So, how do we know? What's going to happen? You have the Word of God. Right? You should know God's will. And through your personal relationship, your yada, to know God, you know what direction and area you're supposed to go. You know when something's not right. You don't need anybody to tell you because you know biblically it's not right. When you see a young man taller than me hurt three girls on a basketball court because he's transgender and he has a beard, it's not right. And you're thinking to yourself, where are the fathers at? Why would they let their daughters go out there? Well, that concludes today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light Radio. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to submit a prayer request or get in contact with us to find out service times, you can do all of that at our website, uh, as well as get uh, our podcast at Spotify, Audible, TuneIn Radio, pretty much wherever you can find a podcast. Uh, you, you can just type in Sun, Salt, and Light, and you'll find it. 